Welcome to another episode of Poor and Tell. I'm your host, John, the Cigar Surgeon. Normally here, as always, with my co-host, June Liu, but we have a bevy of people. So uh, we'll start with June Liu, and then we'll just kind of move around the crowd here. June, how's it going, buddy? Good, man. Good to see you. Uh, just saw you this morning, but nonetheless, good to see you. Uh, on, on, on virtually. That's right. See you didn't fly you, up to no, Canada and break so uh, quarantine rules or anything like that? Yeah. And uh, for his yeah. second appearance on a live pour and tell session, we got uh, Mr. Aaron Loomis, host of Developing Palettes. What's going on, Aaron? Hello. Thank, thank you for it's having great me. Great to have John. you on, buddy. Anytime we can drink together, it's good times. Uh, and last but not least, Absolutely. certainly in the Developing Palettes crew, we got uh, Mr. Seth Guy's Big Tuna making his second appearance. One of one, man. One of, this is, is your this second, my second appearance because you're on the Glenn Farkless yeah, show. We did the, uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Dude, he doesn't remember being there though. That's I don't thing. even remember. I still yes. don't remember. I'm still drinking Glen Fedex since that night. And of course, uh, front and center, we have our special guest tonight, Mr. Alec Rubin. Alec, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it. Enjoying getting, getting to talk from with. Now, be honest, was this just a situation where you heard we were drinking scotch? And you, you just kind of ignored all the parameters. You're like, I heard drinking scotch. I'm in. Don't care what else that has to do with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 100%. No, actually, I um, I was talking to Jonathan Lipson and said, you know, I'd really love to go on and develop some pallets again. You mind reaching out to them for me? And he said, you know, they have poor intel this Saturday. And I said, yeah, I'm on. That's, that's, that's it. That's what I want to be on. We don't, we don't have to talk cigars. Let's talk some whiskey. <laughs> Good well, man. We're all- we're, gonna pour We're always happy man. to be talking whiskey. And this is kind of, um, really, this is our follow-up show. We wanted to highlight some of the whiskeys um, from the great show we had live with uh, Jeff Borschwitz, uh, George Grant, and Kirsten. George Grant being from Glen Farkless and Kirsten being from the, the um, she, I, I forgot her title. It's like Vice President? Just she's a family yeah. member. She's a family member. She, she does everything there. She's a vice yeah. She's the vice president. She's 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 very important. But most importantly, she's uh, she runs one of the many brands that we'll be tasting tonight of Glenfiddich. For those who don't think I can pronounce it right, Glenfiddich and uh, Balvini. Although I don't know if we have anyone pouring Balvini tonight, but we do have a um. Yeah, do you have I some do. Balvini? I have Balvini. Okay. Yeah, oh, I do too. Many. Right. Well, we'll we'll hop right into it. Um. Alec, I, w- I want to know, because I like to talk to people about whiskey, because whiskey, like cigars, I think is kind of one of those interesting things about talking, you know, your origins. What What is your, ex- like, what got you into whiskey? I'm, su- I'm a- got to assume it's your dad, because he's a fiend for whiskey, right? Yeah, not just my father, but just being around the industry in general, everyone I was around, with, you know, drinks whiskey. And once I turned 21, I think the drink I celebrated with my dad with was, uh, was whiskey. And I didn't like it at first, to be honest. Um, and I kind of had to explore a bunch of different whiskeys to start figuring out what I like. And the weird thing is I liked rye before I liked scotch or bourbon. So that's kind of what got me into whiskey, which is kind of like backwards from everyone else. I would say in the world, most people don't like rye first. And then I, saw, I just started drinking more. We have a relationship with William Grandson, so Glenn Fiddick, Valvany, Monkey Shoulder, all that. So I, I started drinking more of their products, really enjoyed it. And then I'd say over the last year and a half, two years, I just went nuts and wanted to learn everything I possibly could about whiskey and try everything out there. And I've been, well, developing my palate for whiskey. Uh, that, that's not intended. Uh, developing my palate for whiskey. Over the last year and a half, two years. And it, I mean, it's a, we were kind of talking a bit in the green room. It's, it's, it's a very deep rabbit hole, you know, talking about both American bourbon and internationally, the various countries that put out whiskey. Of course, we're talking about Scotch whiskey today, but just even within Scotch whiskey, as I demonstrated in the green room, I mean, it is a deep rabbit hole. You can really get lost in finding a million gems within various whiskey brands. Absolutely. It's such a diverse and tasting profile too, right? I mean, it's a, uh, I'm, that's a, that's a good question that you brought to Alec, John. Um, Thank you, Jim. Maybe we should go on to talk about uh, how we all got into whiskey. I'm curious. Cause like, I don't, I mean, I know John, you and I talk about whiskey for 
I don't know, ever since I've known you uh, for years, but I never kind of knew how you got into whiskey. So uh, I'm going to give a shout out to a good friend who's probably not even watching the show because, you know, what the hell? What are friends for? He's probably watching he, Ralphie. So this probably goes back. I was dabbling with whiskey probably 20 years ago. And kind of like Alec, I didn't, I really didn't get into it. Like I really found the overall profile to be off-putting and I would, I would drink a lot of rum and I would drink like a variety of other spirits, but usually in mixed drinks. And I think what it was is that some of my first introductions to whiskey was with peated whiskey, which is just really not the way, I mean, there are some, some supernaturals out there who, and I've met them, both men and women they start drinking peated whiskey and they're like, Oh, I love it. But for me, it was, it it was, you know, it was like drinking, uh, what what is it? I say it's like drinking a railway tile cover, railway tie covered in oil set on fire. And now I go, yeah, that's a fantastic profile. I I love it. I can't, I can't wait to have more, Yeah. but it was extremely (laughs) off putting. So good friend of mine named Charles, uh, he, who, who I call the whiskey slut, uh, because he can't, he can't have bottles in his house because unlike me, I have a, I have a collecting problem where I buy all these whiskeys and then I slowly drink them. He buys whiskeys and he crushes them. So he can't have whiskeys in the house, but he's really the one that kind of took me down this, this uh, everlasting path of, of whiskey. And that was probably 16, 17 years ago now, I would say. Dang. You've been drinking whiskey for that long. Yeah, I am like like seven years years old. old, That's true. Yeah. He, it's yeah, Jim, what, what got you into whiskey, buddy? Um, by initially, I, I mean, I drink whiskey out of just pure necessity to get smashed back in the day. Uh, <laughs> via, you know, like Jameson, taking shots of Jameson and that kind of stuff. But, but I didn't really get into it um, until, oh man. You know, what's funny. I can remember the very first cigar that made me uh, that wowed me. I cannot remember my first whiskey experience when, which I thought, man, this is pretty good. That's interesting. Huh. But like in general, I, uh, <laughs> oh, this is what it is. I used to be a huge beer fan, but as you guys know, and I don't mean to sound like a little bitch when I say this, but when you drink a lot of beer, it makes you really stuffed. And it makes you super bloated and it doesn't make you feel good, right? So, and yeah. then I thought, man, I want something still, I, I, but I, I still, to this day, I really enjoy the flavor of beer, but um, I drink way more whiskey now because, like, whiskey is so, like, flavorful, and the range is vast, right? Like, within, you know, all, uh, even, like, known production of countries that produce distilled beer, I mean, uh, distilled whiskey, uh, and, and create whiskey, it's so different. And like, especially recently, like finding loves, like, I mean, even out of Taiwan, like drinking Kavalon, right? Um, like I didn't, I know Amber has been around for a long time, like Indian whiskey, but like, I didn't really know about it until maybe like, maybe two, three months ago, right? So um, it's absolutely just similar to like cigars. Like I'm doing it for the flavor, uh, not to get smashed, which, but sometimes being smashed is a Go kind of a nice poop. thing. It's all right. Aaron, I don't, I don't <laughs> think we've ever talked about how you got into whiskey. I think you being into whiskey was kind of a surprise to me. Yeah, it was a surprise to me as well. I mean, uh, I'm probably the uh, lowest volume drinker on this. Uh, no doubt. On this chat. There's no evening, doubt. So, yeah. Um, We're not going to start talking about who has the highest no. volume on this one. We know, we? We no, know who we wins that contest. That is. Yeah. Well, yeah, you clearly, clearly win, Seth. <laughs> yeah, but I have a problem. <laughs> yeah, you fucking have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, I've never really been a big drinker. I mean, for the longest time, I probably, I don't, I don't think I really like drank, like, I don't know, I, regularly to me is like, you've got a problem, but uh, like regularly enough, just like what I'm drinking is like, probably not until I was like mid thirties, I would say. So like before that, I just, it just didn't really, you know, appeal to me, um, you know, any kind of and I probably wasn't drinking good booze before anyway, so I just felt like it was just way alcohol forward. There was nothing else really to it, and it was just like that. So, um, but you know, as I got a little older, I started trying different things, and I'm that guy that you referenced, like where uh, a peated whiskey was my really my entrance, and I said, "All right, I like this, so let's go." 
So like a Vol. 16, get started right on that, and then you just kind of go down the rabbit hole. So um, I still don't drink a lot. I love to, you know, I don't buy a lot of bottles just because I don't drink that often. So like if I'm spending 80 bucks on a bottle, that bottle is probably going to last me a few years, right? So I'm more of like, I, I enjoy tasting way more than I like, you know, having, uh, you know, a bottle collection. But um, I just like trying different stuff and, and seeing what's out there. And uh, I'm more definitely down the peated road. But, uh, you know, I like to try different it's stuff. A dangerous, dangerous thing, trying different stuff. Seth, I know you like to drink, yeah. but I don't know that it, we know how you got into scotch. Yeah. Man. Um First scotch I well, <laughs> stealing sips doesn't count, I guess. Stealing <laughs> sips. Because I mean that's when I really got into smoking cigars was like 13. Um, but I probably didn't have really I probably didn't get into like whiskey probably till like after college. Um I think when I went to and this wasn't that far many years ago. I was in Louisville for my grandmother's funeral and we had like time, so we went to Angel's Envy. Um and then doing the whole tour and then and then tasting it, I was like, man, I can really get into this and start drinking it to really enjoy it. Um, and that's when I really, I think, started kind of shopping around bourbons, like with a purpose rather than just kind of like, I'll try something new. Um, but that's probably got into it in terms of actually into like whiskey and so forth. But like I grew up in a house where my parents were scotch drinkers. So that's just, I just kind of grew up and that's, I grew up in a tobacco and scotch family. How did you go wrong? Well, let's get similar, <laughs> similar up, upbringing. Uh. Yeah. Why don't we get into our first pours? Uh, June, you want to lead us off with uh, what your first pour is tonight? Yeah. Um, so this is a scotch that I bought uh, when it was my 30th birthday. So I used to do this thing where every June, you, year of wait, my birthday, I will buy a scotch right that's compared all right. uh, I think he's no. big dicking us. Yep. I saw a wooden, I saw a wooden container. Oh, it, and that's <laughs> yeah. But like, oh, I stopped sorry. doing this because right. it got fucking Carry expensive. On. So, um, so and, and this is fitting because this is a clinic. So, on my thirtieth birthday, huh? oh, yeah, yeah, on my thirtieth birthday, I got the thirty-year version of it. Um, and it's crazy. Like, there's like this like little flap out here. And then Ooh. you can get a little story going on right here with like, I don't know, it tells you about this particular bottle. Um, so typically I would drink this uh, on my birthday every year. So the fill is about, well, I have about a fourth of it left. Uh, the actual bottle is here. It was interesting. I, I went to uh, Costco today. So I bought this bottle for like $300 about six years ago. And I went to Costco today and I saw a bottle of it in their case. And they're selling for six hundred fifty dollars. So, between within the last six years, this thing pretty much uh, more than doubled, He's... which is pretty crazy. So, June for the I'm whiskey nerds out there, because I know people because, care uh, about this stuff. What's uh, what's your bottle number? N- no, no, no. The bottle count? number on your on bottle your thirty, because they're all numbered. This is cast selection number thirty. Uh, 31, sorry. Uh, bottle number 6207. Nice. Bingo. Jim, can I just tell you, my favorite pairing in the world is Glenfiddich 30 with a fine and rare. Mm. No joke. That is my favorite pairing. Yeah. This is a... It, it's... I mean, it, it's a really nice whiskey. Don't get me wrong, but... Uh, Fantastic. I, yeah, I actually think that... Um, it's hard, man. Every every time you go this much in age and you buy a whiskey, uh, you expect exceptional flavors, um, mm-hmm. which, and for me, um, is it worth the money? Most of the time, no. Paying three hundred dollars is not worth the money for buying any whiskey. Um, but like we were talking about before we went live, like you could find absolutely superb bottles for like max, like let's say one hundred and fifty bucks a bottle. Uh, you can find amazing bottles out there, but but this is you know it's one of those also like within well, drinking whiskey, just similar to cigars. Like sometimes you got to break out the good stuff, and it reminds you of the good times, and gives you good memories, right? Um, so this is exactly what that is for me. So. Just, just so you know, they have that bottle at Total Wine between four fifty and five fifty. I've been mm. there before. 
Nice. Well, I'm not buying. I, the last bottle I bought, <laughs> yeah. Just letting it out. Yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to drink that 30 along with you, but uh, my 30 got completely crushed at my stag. So, you know, everyone enjoyed it. Aaron, nice. what do you got going on for your number one? Oh, can't hear you. Can't see it. Rookie, uh, rookie. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, ran, I'm not running God, the show tonight. Stat, full set, set number two. I got the Glenn Farmer as well that I had on the show when we were talking to George and Kirsten. So revisiting this, I drank that uh, all throughout the show, and then we uh, on prime time we did we had um, Toscano on, so I was drinking it with uh, some Toscanos, and uh, it paired well with that actually. So the smokiness from the cigar and the Scotch went well, so it was a it was an enjoyable pairing then. Seth, what do you get going on, buddy? I uh I got another bottle of this uh, Glenfiddich uh fourteen year single yeah, malt Scotch whiskey, the uh, Bourbon Barrel. I pounded that last one half on that show. It's fucked right out like it's like some uh, XXX material. <laughs> Just Can you hold that up <laughs> in front of your face. <laughs> There you that's, go. I mean, that's, it. It. That, that's a and that's a great bottle. Oh, that's right. The blurred background. <laughs> In front of you. I can't. I gotta unblur the thing, man. Getting all fancy. <laughs> it is a good bottle. I. It's the, dude. It's the bottle of my roots, man. The triangular bottle. Like, I grew up. It's one of these things. You know what I'm talking about. You know how your parents have like that, that liquor they drank. Uh, and this isn't trying to make anyone else be an alcoholic here, but you know what I mean? It reminds you of like that, that childhood yeah. thing right there. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Alec, what do you got going on for your number one? Well, I had two, I already tried two bottles off camera that I hadn't had before, but my first one on camera is going to be the uh, Glenfiddich 26. Nice. nice. Yeah, uh, I don't drink this that often, and I don't have that much of it. And I, when I was given the bottle, it wasn't even full. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, Kirsten gave nice. me this bottle. Oh, nice. So, nice. Yeah, yeah, Kirsten gave me this bottle. So, yeah, that's going to be my, my first one for the night, or on camera at least. Yeah, the funny thing about um, Glenfiddich is, I mean, they have a number of bottles that are all under the hundred dollar range, and like I was looking in my cabinet cause I was like, well, I'm going to, you know, I want to round out my bottles tonight and, and pull like my 14 and my 15. It's like, no, I drank all my 14. I drank all my 15 and it's like, oh, okay. It's like that. So I've got like mini bottles of 12 and I, I ended up having to go on the, uh, the deep archives that we'll get into later. But it's funny because it's just, I don't even think about it. You know, it's just kind of one of those bottles that I have something in that range in my cabinet at any given time because it's an easy pour when I don't know what I want. And uh, I'm revisiting one of the ones from our uh, show, the uh, Glenn Farkless 105 Cask Strength. Um, this is kind of one of the uh, old Ooh. school bottles from Glenn Farkless. It's, it's pr again, it's pretty inexpensive. Of course, what I like about it, because you know, we talk about uh, your, your caliber of alcoholism, it's cask strength. It's 60% ABV, 120 proof. And that's kind of my jam, you know, like I really, really like cask strength whiskey. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I feel that for me, cask strength whiskey tends to give me more character within the whiskey. Like I get more depth of flavors if for lack of better description. I completely it... agree with you. And 60% is pretty high for scotch, isn't it? Yeah. I think legally the maximum you can bottle it at is 65 and I've got some, I've got some uh, single cast stuff that's, you know, high 63s, high 64s. And, but the weird thing is, so this is like, this is a, this is a pretty punchy 60. Like this is a 60 where I go, I could probably add water to this and it'd be fine. But I've also got some, you know, 60, 62, 63s. And I'm like, is this like a low 50 proof? You know, this is a dangerous, dangerous whiskey. So I find that oftentimes the ABV, the proof doesn't necessarily tell you kind of how strong it is as you know as a as a word to describe the the body i guess or the alcohol intensity yeah yeah i think especially if you're uh used to drinking like cast drink bourbon um like when you go 
back to like non American whiskey cash strength. Um, like I, I find that it's easier to take. Like some of those bourbons out there are freaking super hot. Uh, but like Stag Junior, I mean, I know the recent Stag Juniors are really tasty, but like the first few batches that came out there is pure heat. Um, so I found that when I go back to like Scotch cast strength, for instance, um, like uh, for, for me, uh, I'm able to kind of get more used to it um, as compared to like sniffing through like a really high ABV kind of a bourbon. Well, even like Knob Creek, the uh, cast strength rye is a beast. Yeah, that's a monster. Um, you know, it's just I and I you know I don't I don't care if people say I I think it's such a beast that it's great to mix with if you're going to do something with just because that ABV is so high that when you add like add it in a mix I don't care if it's blasphemy because it's a you know I guess some people would say it's maybe it's more expensive but it just kind of you're still getting that rye presence while you you have your mixed drink as well if that makes any sense. Yeah, because I think the the issue with a mixed, so I mean, I guess there's a couple different, you know, talking about mixed drinks, there's a couple different approaches. You either get the people that just want a mixed drink and they don't want to taste the alcohol, and then you get the people who Mm -hmm. I assume is probably all of us where I get a mixed drink, I want to taste the alcohol, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to taste bitters, I mean, I do want to taste bitters, but I don't want to just taste orange and bitters. I want, if I'm getting an Old Fashioned or something like that, I want it, I want it punchy, I want some... I want that alcohol to punch through. Yeah, we call it a spirit forward to not make it nice. sound like forward. alcoholics. Nice. Yeah, spirit forward. Yes. <laughs> not you should try a you should try an old fashioned with that Glenfiddich fourteen. It actually is phenomenal. That does Ooh, sound like it'd be tasty. Interesting. It's, it's a bourbon. It has that bourbon finish on it, so it kind of gives the characteristics of Scotch and bourbon. You get that sweetness on it from the bourbon side, and it makes a great old fashioned. Huh. Yeah. Look at that. Dropping, dropping knowledge Dropping bombs, helping out. me out. Feeding the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this this 105 for me is, um, I mean, it's tasty and I enjoy it, but it is definitely hot. Uh, it's got a lot of, uh, you know, what I would call spice on it. Um, obviously the, 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 the sherry character comes through, but this is obviously because it's a no age statement. It's clearly younger whiskey, so I don't really get a lot of that heavy, jammy, sherry character that I do on some of the older Glen Farklesses, where it's spent a lot of time in a sherry butter or punching. Um, and you, you can kind of tell a little bit by the color, although you know many times the color is is not necessarily indicative. But when it comes to sherried whiskeys, I do find that you know the darker the better, and if I can get something nice and nice and black like my Cold Dead Heart, then that's kind of an easy buy for me. Looks like a nice little uh, Colorado if we're going by cigar oh, wrapper nice coloring right way there. To pull it back to tobacco, Seth. <laughs> this is a spirit show, buddy. We're not. We're not talking. I'm I just, just was. You can talk with I'm smoking. Want. That's why. Uh, I'm actually going to move on to my second whiskey because um, it's been sitting there for a while, and I, I just I don't want it to be lonely. And uh, it's funny because I pulled this out on the show. I've had this for a while. This is the uh, Glen Farkless Twenty One. And when I was pulling it out, I didn't even notice until George was on the show. But George Grant is, he signed <laughs> it. So I was pouring it and I'm like, oh my God, I forgot he signed it. Uh, he comes out to Calgary all the time for tastings. We're really, really blessed. Uh, June and I were kind of talking about this earlier today that because of the tax center here, we, we don't have particularly high taxes on spirits. And as a result, naturally, that means that a lot of scotch flows through Calgary. In fact, Alberta is kind of known as really the Scotch center for Canada. So as a result, all the brand managers, owners come out here all the time. So like George is out here, I would say on average two, three times a year. So it's great to sit down at a tasting with someone like that and uh, taste some, some really good stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to have a little sip of my number two here and uh, you guys jump in and talk about uh, if you're ready to move on to your number two whiskey. I'm I think it's pretty good. Get on that with you. Say that again. Tell me the notes you get on that whiskey when you get a second. I mean, it's, um, it. off the nose, it is, it is like a tropical fruit jamboree. So you talk about. You get the almond. Big citrus. Citrus like, at all? Um, 
like not grapefruit, but um, but not orange. You know, like something in between orange and grapefruit. So it doesn't have that sourness of grapefruit, but it's got that that sharp citrus of orange. I'm just Kiwi. messing with you because I'm, I'm just, just I'm just nice. reading the back of the of the same. Bottle. Is that your number two? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> no, I just happen to have it here. So. You always have to be. You, you have to take when you, when you take the notes. You have to be very descriptive because then right. people really can't argue with you. This yeah. is this is a, this is like one of the like, my retailers one time talked about. Instead of saying like leather, you got to get like in depth. And he was like talking about because I guess one of his cars had like the whole Napa leather coloring. He's like, oh man, I'm getting this Napa leather note, and people are like, <laughs> oh man. This Napa leather from the BMW premium this. package. <laughs> you just got to add that little little detail in there, and people won't argue. They're like, "Holy shit, this guy's got Cal- a power California like no orange, other. definitely not that Florida orange." You know what I mean? Like, the, get that distinct difference. There's a distinct difference between the soils. Oh, and absolutely. Stuff. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> about, a little like, bit more of a mineral quality. Citrus? Yeah. Oh, sumo citrus. Oh, yeah. Those are so good, oh, man. They are good. That and the oh, uh, cotton candy grapes. Have oh, you guys had the cotton candy grapes? grapes? I have yeah. had those. That thing, that's not natural, man. There's what the, the heck? Better when you, the better when you freeze them. Grapes. Oh, you freeze them? I haven't done that. Yeah. Cotton candy them. grapes, June. Wait, what is that? It's like a grape. Well, it's a grape, but they taste like cotton candy. Yeah, I kid yeah, you not. Yeah. I can't yeah, describe it. Right? They remind me of uh, gummy worms. Hmm. Like regular gummy worms yeah, or? Like regular okay. gummy worms. Oh, I can't see the color. <laughs> Down, that down, one on down, the left is a little bit redder. Or yeah. your right. Down. down. Yeah. Your right yeah. is dark. John's right and my left. Yeah. I keep forgetting oh. you guys are on a different camera for me than the Alec, uh, show uh, camera. So the show the show sees it up here. And you guys see it down here. But you, oh, you can yeah. see the color difference. Yeah, right. Alec, uh, can you tell us about the whole because you guys do like quite a bit, right? And within your cigar events? Yeah. Um, can you kind of run us through what you guys do for those events? Yeah, so I don't really, uh, who was it? Ian Miller, who worked at Glen Fiddick, and my, and my father met probably 10 years ago at, at an event, and there was just this natural synergy. So he became friendly with Mitch, Mitch Bashard, who just moved back to Scotland recently, uh, Kirsten Grant, who you guys had on the show, and a few other people like Glen Fiddick, and it just kind of seemed like this, you know, natural partnership and to this day it's, it's just a handshake partnership and we basically just um combine our events so if we have a stock of Glen Fiddick at at our office and whenever we're, we're doing certain events in certain states depending on what the legality is in that state we're able to send bottles of Glen Fiddick out to our events and do pourings and tastings um on, on those products uh for Glen Fiddick, and then they do the same thing with with our cigars. They uh, buy them from us and do a uh, do cigar tasting at their Glen Fiddick event. And it's just been this awesome back and forth partnership. Sometimes, uh, depending on the event, one of their ambassadors will show up to the event um, and speak about the whiskey themselves. But also, every single year at our national sales meeting, someone from Glen Fiddick comes, trains all of our reps on their product, so we're able to speak intelligently about it. And you know know exactly what we're you know what we're talking about basically, and it's just been this this great this great partnership that we've had for about ten years now, and there's been a lot of great whiskey that's come out of it too for us on our side at least. Yeah, we uh, we saw a healthy stash of them when we went to visit your uh, headquarters <laughs> a couple years ago. <laughs> it, 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 got, it got bigger. It got bigger. <laughs> It's funny because uh, you guys, of course, had your big show last year at the uh, PCA, and uh, the guys ended up leaving me behind because uh, one of the people he had DJing the event is someone that I followed on Instagram for like I don't even know how many years, and it was it was I mean naturally you guys have a close relationship with Glenn Fittick, but I wasn't expecting to see him there. It's Dave Paradis, and I kind of yeah I walked is, yeah. I walked past him and I'm like Dave, and he goes. John? And I'm like, what are you doing here? And he goes, what are you doing here? Uh, and it's just kind of funny, you know, that, that crossover between sort of the tobacco world and the, and the whiskey world. Um, and of course, you know, great whiskeys, great people, great, great cigars. So it was, uh, it was a pretty great night over at the, uh, Alec Bradley compound. Yeah, we, um, 
it's it's actually pretty funny. We just have such a great relationship with all the uh, ambassadors of Glenfiddich that we called up Dave and we're like, hey, we're going to Vegas. We we're going to get a DJ, but you DJ, and we're going to be playing Glenfiddich anyways. Um, do you want to come out to the event and DJ at the event? He's like, um, yes, I'll be there. <laughs> and that was it. It was that simple. And you guys, the, I mean, obviously, the nice thing about that is for people who appreciate the difference between budget whiskey and perhaps, you know, quote unquote, top shelf whiskey, you guys were not skimping that night. Um, there's some, there's some pretty premium Glenfiddich being, uh, poured that night. And, uh, I certainly appreciated that. Thank you. I think there were some 18 mm-hmm. and 21 there, right? Yeah. There was, it was like uh, 15, Bogart 15, all the 18. 18 yeah, j- yeah, that 18. Yeah, it is spectacular. <laughs> I jumped right on that because I knew that the, uh, as soon as people found out the older stuff was there, whether they knew or appreciated it or not, they were going to hop on that. So I was like, well, it lasts. I better get a dram. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I was going to bring 18 on the show tonight, but I figured I had some other stuff that I don't drink that often, like the 26. I don't even know what else I have. I think I have a 21 with me, of which I never drink 21 or 26, really. So I brought those with me tonight. But uh, 18 is one of my favorites. For sure. 18 is just a great product. It's a little on the pricier side, but it's, that's a whiskey where I could say, even though it's a little pricier. It's yeah, I think for it. me, the the 14 and the 18 are kind of my go-to expressions. Um, I mean, obviously, I've had the 30. It was phenomenal. But sort of my daily stalkers that I'm, you know, kind of have a fixed position in my cabinet, the 14 and the 18 are just no-brainers. So for different reasons. For me, it's the 12 and the 15, mm. honestly. The 12 just got some, just has this beef to it. That's so nice. It goes in any cocktail. It's such an easy drinker, but it's still got, it's still got enough there for a 12 where you can still taste it. And the 15 is just so nice. It, it's such a, such a great whiskey. June, what do you got going on for, uh, for number two after your, your delicious 30? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure if I drink this. Hurt. I'm not sure if I drank this um, on the show when we had oh, Kirsten. Um, I'm not at all um, jealous right now. Having a 21, yeah, 20 <laughs> wood. I yeah. love this bottle, man. I I remember one of my locals like two years ago. Cause I think MSRP for this bottle is like, I think it's near 200. Yeah, I think so. But like uh, this one local that I used to frequent quite a bit, he was blowing them out for like 140 dollars a bottle. Um, so I so I stocked up. Um, but I love it. I it you know what's interesting about drinking all the scotches. Um, I had a, a especially during the winter time. I've been drinking so much bourbon, like just cast drink barrel proof bourbon after barrel proof bourbon. But to come back to like scotch and to lower the ABV, right, uh, and to also find all the complexities within scotch that I didn't necessarily appreciate or know beforehand um, has been really nice. Um, and it's so much more drinkable than like, because, you know, bourbon typically is this like, oh, give me this, you know, it's, they're very forward uh, notes, right? It's bold, you know, typical like this American kind of a style, I guess you could say. Uh, but it's super nice to like go back to scotch and find nuances I didn't know. Like I was drinking a, like Red Breast 15 the other day. And I was like, man, I forgot how like buttery, toffee, like biscuity Irish whiskey is um that i completely forgot about that i love so much so it's pretty you mind if i speak on that for a sec yeah of course go for it so i was just thinking about this recently also because i've been drinking a lot of high abv bourbons as well it's like the elijah craig barrel proof stuff like Mm -hmm. that and the way i kind of thought thought about it is like when you get into cigars you might start something mild to medium like connecticut or light shape uh light shade habana i'm not trying to take this to uh, tobacco but I thought about, you know, pe- people end up moving up to these really strong, a lot of Lee Harrow cigars. But sometimes when you go back to that, maybe medium body Connecticut or a light Habano, you realize there are notes there that you didn't notice before. And it's really nice to go back to some of those sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah is, totally. I think the same thing of what you're saying right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I um, speaking of cigars, the same way, like I probably overall as a wrapper of a cigar i probably enjoy more the softer like connecticut shades um that's out there than like more cases than not right 
Um, mm -hmm. And it's because I just really enjoy nuance and I don't want to get beat over the head with strength, right? Like, I don't want to get beat over the head and, uh, you know, be done with like a couple of drams or something at 130 proof and just, you know, feel it immediately, and, you know, go to the dome and feel it. So, yeah, I mean, I think you know. for me, scotch and cigars have always been a natural combination. And it's funny to me how, because I'll show up at a tasting here and I, oh, I know now to always bring cigars because I guarantee that in a, you know, in a group of scotch fiends, you're always going to have a half a dozen guys who are either really into cigars or into cigars enough that they're more than happy to light up and pair with a cigar. To me, I think it's just, like, it's, it's almost become to the point where it's, it's approaching rum and cigars or coffee and cigars where it's just so easy to pour a dram and light up a cigar because to me, it's just the, the notes just, it's just an amazing combination. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that is uh, I actually don't like pairing cigars uh, with alcohol. I don't like pairing like food with alcohol, cigar, alcohol. I don't like any of that. I I like to actually enjoy each individual thing uh, by itself, um, which is why, like, typically if I'm – let's say it's like a Saturday. I mean, it's, it's shelter in place. Not like I have – are we still go, doing but, that? Are we still uh, sheltering like in place? I'm, is that still a thing? I don't even. <laughs> what we're is locked this? in for another month, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this we is like California. May two hundred and seventeenth for me. Yeah. So, so. I, I just have auto ordered uh, scotch now to my door. They just know to show up every week, bring a bottle or two, and yeah. Yeah, like I don't. I so if I know that you know it's a Saturday weekend, that's not shelter in place. Uh, uh, if I know I want to taste whiskey and do some AB tastings, um, I prefer to not smoke cigars. Uh, unless if I am like did that way early in the day, and then at, like later on, later on in the night, um, I'll light up a cigar. But I, but I typically don't light up anything that's really um, nice, just to kind of like, you know, something easy going that I don't have to think too much towards. Um, and same as wine. Like, I, I really enjoy wine, but I don't like eating food with wine. <laughs> Oh. It's weird. What? I get, I get no. that. No. I, get I mean, that. I, 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 I understand that. Like, if I'm going to a tasting, like if I'm doing a vertical or something, I won't smoke a cigar beforehand because I find that you know it does. Uh, I wouldn't say jack my palate up, but certainly it, it, it is an impact on my palate. Um, but man, I tell you, pairing with like whether it's cigars or whiskey, pairing with food, pairing with each other. I just, I, you know, my uh, my old boss used to say, uh, if I got a whiskey in my hand or I got a cigar in my hand, I'm just playing. But if I have a cigar in one hand and I have a whiskey in the other, it probably means I'm working. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So here's my number two for the night. Um, it's the Balvenie, the Sweet Toast of American Oak. I think these are limited edition. Oh, yeah. Um I've made a little bit of a dent in that bottle. It's it's pretty nice. I'm I'm excited to drink That's it great tonight. Bottle. Nice. And I, I think what's nice about that yeah. is that for a time I got the impression that a lot of whiskey distilleries were kind of moving away from bourbon wood. Like they were, you know, I think sherry got really hot for a while and I think people forgot how good a really nice bourbon cask whether it's fully matured or, or finished in can be, you know, like there's, there's, there's a lot of complexity in that wood that I think people, it seems like people are kind of coming back around to, you know, first, first mature bourbon or first fill bourbon and uh, really, really getting excited about that. Hmm. That American Oak, man. Everybody loves our oak. You know what's interesting about that is, like, if you look at the bourbon world, you know, uh, it's it's new char barrels, right? Mm -hmm. So what's being more focused on now is uh, the second and subsequent maturation, right? Which is, uh, whether it is in a port cast or, of course, the ever so popular sherry cast, um, I feel like bourbon is kind of, like, changing it up, especially, like, craft distilleries. Like a lot of craft distilleries, distilleries, I will see them play around with um, like secondary uh, maturation of the cast and basically 
you know, either I don't want to say mask the youngness of their, or just kind of like make it smooth it out or even it out or give it to whatever you know profile they want it to be. So, um, which I think is great, right? Like I don't get me wrong, like I, I love Kentucky Straight Bourbon, but I think it's super awesome to do like all sorts of variations, especially when you get all sorts of different distilleries that opens up all over the the U.S. Um, what right? is a like, bourbon after that? That's what I'm asking. Uh, no, not necessarily, but no, it's delicious. I care about the. Yeah, delicious. Cool. I mean, listen, color. Angels Envy, Angels Envy is put in um, port afterwards. Um, yeah, they just came out with Tawny Port for two hundred fifty dollars, which is ridiculous. But yeah, I mean, so it, it it definitely adds depth and and complexity. I think it it brings it down a little bit. I mean, it's, well, it's, not, it's not considered bourbon no, at that point. It's just American whiskey. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah, it's just whiskey. I mean, you finish it in something like Joseph Magnus finishes their stuff in like three different barrels. No. Yeah. Delicious, yeah. but, you know, it's not bourbon, technically. Yeah, not bourbon. Yeah. yeah. It's bourbon. Aaron, what you got going on for number two tonight? So I just picked this up yesterday, which is uh, Balvenie Peat oh, Week. Oh, yeah. So I that's guess a, that's an older see. bottle, then. Yeah, 2003 vintage. Uh, they they switched up the name to the Week in Pete, right? Is that how they kind of yeah? Now did it's, it. Now it's Week Week of Pete. So yeah, if you do a Week of Pete. That's a newer newer vintage. Yeah. So I guess once one week a year, they uh, distill um, they distill scotch with uh, with also by uh, you know toasting with uh, with the peat. So it's like a this one little small batch kind of project that they do so then i just try this since i'm a, a big uh peated whiskey fan and uh it's quite interesting i mean once i once i poured it the whole room is just filled with the aroma of peat it's just like it's instantly there <laughs> but it's not yeah. over, it's not overly overly powering when you drink it i mean um the nice thing about it is that it's like a, <laughs> there you go it completely just kind of coats your palate like it's got a, like this little oily oiliness to it um, but it's it's quite smooth. Um, it's you know forty eight point three percent, which was is lighter than the or was heavier than the Glenfarclas twelve, but it feels much smoother than the Glenfarclas does. So um, it's just interesting. It just but there's a lot of peat there, um, so you you know you do get that. It's not like a Vulin level, but you know you definitely gonna get some some peat to it. So it's it's a pretty nice uh, it's a pretty nice pour. It's so weird of uh, figuring out Aaron. Within not only his cigar palette, his but scotch palette, his yeah. whiskey palette, like it, man, like I mean, he's still all over lot, the board. Yeah, he like is. it's so hard to figure out. Yeah, he's all over the board for cigars. And I remember, like one of the first times I had like Lago Vula sixteen with him, and I was expecting him to just like shit all over it, be like, "What the hell am I drinking?" But he's like, "Wow, this is good." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> he was like, "Good." <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, hard to start out and just immediately like Isla stuff, right? Yeah. So. But getting getting back to your point there, Aaron, about the ABV, I mean, it, it like I said, it is funny that you can have a forty percent ABV which tastes really hot, and then you can turn around and have a forty eight percent ABV, and and it like it's not alcohol for it at all. So I find a lot of times the the ABV doesn't necessarily tell you much about the character of the whiskey at all, other than you know whether it's going to be barrel proof or not. And to, to me, yeah. And to me, I'm very, I'm very averse to like just kind of the alcohol, alcohol forwardness of any kind of spirit or even wine. And I find that peated whiskey really masks that kind of heat or that alcohol forward component. Mm. So that's, I think that's why I kind of, you know, gravitate towards the the peated stuff because it just, it's got, it's got like a, there's a barrier there that kind of masks that, and and it gives you another. At least for my palate, it gives me another kind of thing to focus on, other than the alcohol itself. I'd be interested to see if Aaron like yeah, right. More. Get him oh, a geez. get him a six one or I, a seven I'm actually, one. Yeah, before Even that, a ten one. So what is that, this that I we're want, talking about now? So Brook Lottie does this line called Octomore. Uh huh. It, it is their like. You know, super. Is it the yeah, peatiest peat? Yeah, it's the peatiest okay. peat that's ever peated. Like some of the stuff. Because I've, you know, I've seen one out there called Peat Monster. No, that's Compass Box. Yeah, sure. but there's, it's no, just no. like the Octomore, who peat the peatiest peat. No, Octomore. Yeah, pretty much. Octomore is like eating te- Texas yeah. barbecue. 
It's like you liquid know. smoke. Yeah, I'm and it's that. Yeah, yeah, I'm into that. Yeah, and yeah. it's and it's also incredibly meaty tasting as well. Oh yeah, a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, not just the that. denseness and and smoke wood, right? But uh, like like the 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 heaviness and meatiness of like bacon and all that. But oftentimes oh, people fuck. get that in Octomore. Talk my language. Man, I'm looking at these bottles. This is funky. Yeah. You're looking at I'm curious. The Octomore bottles. But as Alec was saying, <laughs> you get into that territory and all of a sudden the, the price starts to uh, go up quite sharply, unfortunately. Yeah, man. It's, yeah, collecting this stuff is no joke. I'm, I'm actually curious. So when we do the Lafroig show, um, I want to, because I don't know if you guys seen these videos out there where people taste Lafroig 10 for the first time. And then they describe it. It's it's pretty fucking hilarious. So I'm curious because, uh, so when I drop samples off later on for you, Aaron, I'm gonna yeah. pour you a sample of the Fork Ten. I want you to uh, describe what you taste in that because people okay. come up with like, they, some people will say like it tastes like mermaid oh, piss. It's a, it's a burning, <laughs> it's a burning tire <laughs> fire, and I love it. Burning tire fire in seawater. Yeah, yeah, burning tire. Do you have any Octomore, Jin? I have, um, I have a couple. I don't, di- I don't dive into it too much. Um, I have the Event Horizon. I have, what is it? I think it's called. I, I bought one. I bought a couple like two, three years ago. Um, I can't. It's a little too much for me, honestly. Like I don't exactly remember which ones I have. Just stock. drop them off oh, yeah. in my house and you come over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I'll give back to you if it all like. Yeah, I, uh, I, I love. Um, you know, I mean, I love the art bags. I love the. You know, Lagavulin's and you know uh, some Lafroig stuff, but Octomore sometimes could be a bit um, intense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How about some like Highland Park? Yeah, that's uh, speaking of Highland Park. That's how I got into same same. Oh, you're right. Okay, my very Highland first Park? Scotch Wild Scotch was Highland Park 18. About I want to say nine ten years ago, Buddy brought it over. Um, because before that, we would drink like Johnny Walker Blue, and then we would think that we're like Big Pimpin', which <laughs> was a lie. Ben, <laughs> the but uh, the first really nice wowing kind of scotch I had was Highland Park 18. That was way before I got into bourbon and any of that kind of stuff. So Yeah, Highland Park, yeah. 12. Highland Highland Park 12 and McAllen 12 used to be, I mean, when I got into whiskey, that was kind of my, those are my two go-tos, those are my favorite 12 year expressions and great because at the time they were, you know, like you could get a bottle of Island Park 12 for like $38. You could get a bottle of McAllen 12 for like $42. So it's a pretty good yeah. value. Oh, there's still good values. I think McAllen 12 now is like 50 bucks. Yeah, it's not crazy. Bucks. Um, no, but that's McAllen's interesting. Uh, I feel like the more I read about McAllen within these like, geeky you know forums uh uh the people have a tendency to kind of crap on mccallan because they're like you know because the they think m means uh not mccallan m means marketing um and the bottles sell for a lot more than it should they're like don't drink mccallan go drink glendronic <laughs> well, glendronic, glendronic is great. great yeah i love, I love brown foreman right yeah brown foreman in general was killing it man in the whiskey game Glendronic 15 is, is a great bottle. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, the one gosh. thing I will say about McAllen is, is, for me, a lot of their stuff is overly sherry. I was going to say, is palate. there such a thing as overly sherry? Is that a. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. <laughs> that are yeah. too sweet. That are like that sweet. And that's just a little too sweet for me. Yeah, the, the mm. Glen. We were talking earlier today. It's funny you should bring it up because we were talking earlier today about some of the Glendronic uh, cask series they've got. And yeah, if I mean, if you find overly sh- they're just the sherriest bombs of sherriest bombs. Like the, the bottles are blood red. And I mean, just as soon as you pop the cork, you're just getting huge, huge jammy sherry notes, which I love. But, you know, the, the cask series. From Gladronic. Yeah, they've been. Yeah, it gets up there pretty quick. Seth, you got a number two tonight? 
Oh, that's such a good bottle. It's it's funny because Kirsten was Kirsten was talking in the show about she said people got so mad when the when we said that you know the bottle was going away, and I I had to bite my tongue because I was one of those people like that 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 Caribbean cask was just. I mean, it's so magical for a 14 year old. Uh, for me, the the flavor profile outperformed a lot of 18s, and like that was kind of one of those perfect bottles where you could just sit down with a group of people, crack the 14, and just go to town. I mean, that bottle unfortunately would not last very long, uh, which is in the current market. If you if you can see the 14 and you like the 14, you should probably snap it up because they're not going to be around for too much longer. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't be further from the truth. Hundred percent. I also find the uh, the Belvini Double Wood, the 12 year, I find that to be a great, like when somebody doesn't have a lot of experience with scotch and they're looking for a recommendation, to me that's a pretty easy first start because it doesn't have any really sharp flavor characteristics. It's very soft. It's very balanced. It's not alcohol forward. Uh, it's got an, it's got enough sweetness to, to sort of get people in there who aren't really a big fan of, of you know, big alcohol flavors. Uh, but it doesn't overwhelm the the characteristics that are there. Um, so, you know, again, to me, that's one of those bottles. The the double wood is just as soon as I get low, I auto sort of auto buy a new one because it's it's always got a kind of permanent place on my shelf. Oh boy. Now is that bottle opened? Then I would say that 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 would probably be the way to go. <laughs> That's right. That was a good conversation though. We we're talking uh, in the green room about uh, cork, and it came up on the show, uh, I think briefly, um, that of course with a natural cork. Uh, there's a tendency in scotch bottles, especially older scotch bottles. And I think many of us have had that happen where you go to pop the cork and the cork just falls apart because it's so dry. Um, so there was, there was kind of an interesting sidebar conversation prior to us going live about, uh, what you should do for that. Yeah. Otherwise, I think if, yeah, they were saying, well, I've heard this uh, from other uh, distillery owners that, if, I mean, obviously, if you leave it on its side, the, the high alcohol content will literally just eat away at the cork. So, like, you know, it wouldn't take very long, like a few months, and the, the cork would just be mulch. I, yeah, that's, that's, that's a full day. I, I have not, I've not rotated any of my bottles. So, uh, I shudder to think what some of the corks are doing on some of those bottles because, uh, especially the high, high proof stuff. I don't know.
man. That's just <laughs> put it it's, it's, hey, it's a bunch of lies. Just sorry, it sorry to interrupt, but um, <laughs> real quick, I just got a text from Jonathan Lipson. He said, "Let John know that some of us can only hear him and no one else." Oh, whoa. Is it down so right uh, now? It seems to be fine. Um, I, I, it, well, it should. Sorry, I should say it is. It should be back now. I don't know what happened, but the uh, the audio feed, the main audio feed for I, you guys, just cut out for no reason whatsoever. Okay, I just asked him if he can hear us now, so we'll see. Now it's back. Yeah. He said. He said it's back. So yeah, sh- <laughs> this is what happens when I when I'm spending all my time drinking and not watching the uh, the audio meters, because uh, you can see on the audio meter it's completely dead. But um, you know, whatever. It happens. Ho- hopefully, can it was you just hear me? I, hopefully, it was just June and I talking. Can you hear me, John? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you may want to just check my video because I think on the stream I I dropped off for a bit and I came back, so my video might be out of sync with the rest oh, of you guys. Oh, okay. Well, now I understand why the audio uh, cut out because uh, the audio was tied to uh, to your stream. So uh, I I oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I blame Aaron. It's all Aaron's fault. <laughs> there you go. My fault. Hey, I'm so thrilled I... that I'm not responsible for any of this. Good, I'll shoot it. Yeah. Just, you know, to get it down and be polite, but mm. generally, no shot. So I've restarted the stream, um, so hopefully uh, hopefully everything mm. comes back for everyone. Uh, sir, we had a technical issue. Uh, I, blame, I blame our illustrious uh, leader, Aaron. It's all his fault. <gasps> Fucking Skype, man. We should go to Zoom. We should try to go to Zoom next time. We can go to Zoom. This. We, we yeah. will. We just didn't do it today because it was being already being used. So. Oh. Anyway. But we'll be we'll be good. Thanks All thanks right. for. I'm finding out right now. For good. I think you're doing a great job, John. I just want to say yeah. that yeah. you guys have all been fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I fucking love Canada. Love thanks, guys. <laughs> love you all. Uh, so, in, in the interest of continuing to drink, uh, I'm going old school. Uh, this is this goes back. Gosh, it's got to go back uh, maybe eight, ten years. This is the uh, Glenfiddich uh, Distillers Edition. So this was this yeah. was a limited run. Um, it was a very you just show us that last. Yeah, time. I didn't crack this last time because um, you know I've got like seventy five bottles open and I didn't want to open another bottle. But uh, you know what, Alec, you're worth it, buddy. So just want to let you know. Can you send me a sample of that? Am I am, am I yeah, that worth it? Absolutely. You're not worth it. Um, Can you just bring that? Well, not anymore because it's open. I'd have to. Yeah, I'd have to duct tape it. Um, hopefully, our audience can uh, let us know whether our stream is is back or not. Okay, good. Everything is good right now. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. good. Yeah, I got it um, back. Thank you, Alan Rubin. So this is the. Uh, <laughs> no, oh, perfect. So yeah, so this is fifty-one percent. I think I think they actually describe this as uh, cask strength. Um, but this bottle was extremely divisive. There was a lot of people that like did not like this bottle at all. Like they said, it was the worst expression from Glenfiddich that they ever put out. Uh, I happened to love it. And at the time, I think I bought like three or four bottles because to me and talking to Alec, you were talking earlier about cask strength and, and dollar proposition. Uh, normally cask strength stuff is not cheap. And it was like, I want to say it was like $74, $76 Canadian. And so I, I was like, well, you guys are crazy. This is great. And I picked up three or four bottles. So this is, this is one of my last bottles. Um, but yeah, this stuff is, it's phenomenal. I think it's a great, it's a great um, example of, you know, what cask strength whiskey can be from a distillery. I should have picked minute. up some of that. Well, that must be like twenty dollars yeah, yeah, American, like, right? T- well, it's like two dollars <laughs> fifty cents or they something. Yeah. Five. They pay you. They five. pay you, and they so give cheap. it to you. Yeah. Poor Canadians. They're probably like, "Fuck these Americans." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's that's hot though. It's definitely hot. Anybody got a third whiskey tonight? Well, Alec, you have a third whiskey. I just. I just took my first sip with that original. That was a good choice. Nice. This is fantastic. I went. Uh, I I went outside the boundaries. I'm I'm drinking something that's outside of what we're supposed to be is drinking. There, is there drinking rules? I don't think there's there drinking is. rules. I don't know. I thought we're drinking a well, or something. <laughs> I'm taking a shot. 
Uh, so, if you guys haven't had Glendronic's oh, it's so good. cast strength, I have not. It is fucking amazing. This is batch eight, which is the newest batch. Uh, so, I, I I don't know if this makes you sound like an alcoholic, but I have these little like sip, these little like solo cups inside my car. So sometimes I go to like Total Wine and like you know whisk you know whiskey shops and and I buy it. Uh, and if I'm really interested to see if it's good, I will pop it right open in the car and I will drink it. And if I like it, I will go back and I would load up. So um, I bought six more bottles after I. They won't open one. the bottle for you in the store. No, man, we're in California. You wait. So you put it in a little like red solo cup. Yeah, in your car. Then, yeah, and then and that's what you're afraid about being an al- alcoholic for. Yeah, because oh, I don't think man, a lot of people. <laughs> that kind of makes me feel even worse than what I. <laughs> car, the car's the car's Steph still buys the bottle and I thought, walks to the door. He's got it tipped up, right? I, yeah, I mean, it's California man, you're I, you're you're the Carolinas. Listen, I don't taste it like just in that. First of all, if you're gonna drink it in your car, you never bring like a red solo cup or anything which looks suspicious. You no, have a little taster cup. I just like I, to pause and remind matter. our audience to, to go not full. drink and drive and be responsible with their alcohol intake. Yeah, don't drink and drive. Uh, carry on, Seth. Dude, come on. It's, it's like it's it's you know what? Uh, I spit. I spit it. I spit it out. Proper glass attire. Bring proper glass attire. That way, they're like, "There's no way that guy's drinking." You know, like if you have like one of those classic traditional mint julep cups, you drive around one of those. <laughs> no mint julep, like with the uh, stainless steel, as one does. And then, as one does, mm. as as we were supposed to do today. And then the cops are like, "There's no way that guy's drinking a mint julep while he's driving." It's like there's something else in there because it's so I obvious. The nice thing about my, my local liquor store is that if it's not too limited, they will open the bottle in the store for me to try before I buy buy one. Is it like I don't think it's you not could state do that in California? You can do that in Florida. Yeah, you can do that here. That's why. Well, they do like a ton of tastings at Total Wine and stuff. Yeah. No, they yeah. don't do tastings at Total Wine. Not a lot. They don't. Not not for spirits. For oh, wine. For wine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Not for so spirits. They- so then, yeah, this is probably a perfect time for me to plug one of my favorite bottle shops here, Kensington Wine Market. Um, Andrew Ferguson is the owner, and uh, they've got a pretty legendary selection of whiskey, and they do some pretty awesome tastings. And same situation, you know, if there's if if they have a bottle open, uh, they're more than happy to do a tasting for that bottle, which is great. Um, I find that a lot of times, the really the primary reason I'll go to a tasting is because it's, it's a, it's $150 cheaper than just buying bottles randomly and not liking them. So, yeah. 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 I agree. That's the crazy thing about like private, even like private liquor stores. Like I'm in North Carolina, it's state run, but like when we were down, I was in like for a wedding in Atlanta or like when I'm up in Washington DC from my bro- visiting my brother, like private liquor stores, you're like, oh my gosh, like the, the options are out of out of control. It's fantastic here because it's not state yeah. run. The only nice thing about state run is the prices are a lot cheaper, and there's certain things that you can find huh. all the time. Yeah, but I hear they're I kind of shady too, though. Like with a state run, they, you know, they were supposed. To, I, I hear there's some like shady secondary kind of pricing and. Favoritism that goes out for state-run control. What, what do you mean like by true? favoritism? Like, yeah, like a certain stores will get certain. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I think that I think that happens even with private, though. I mean, it's definitely oh, gonna course. it's gonna yeah. happen with private, but just as much. I mean, the crazy thing, like, if I go to the beach, like I'm in Greensboro, I can go to all the ABC stores here, and they all basically have like the same thing. And when I was at the beach, you know, we go to the beach like every, once a week every year. It's one of these things. I first time I went to the liquor store. I was like, God, it's gonna be, it's gonna be crappy selection. It's just gonna be like cheap liquors just for like college kids and so forth at the beach. And it was the best selection ever because it's like they they pack those stores for people going to the beach because when people are at the beach, they they get really good bottles of stuff of everything. The bourbon and scotch selection was fantastic. Hmm. But at some of the state run stores, I believe they also keep some stuff in the back for some of their best customers. I mean, it's worth at private at private stores. 
But I think they still do it at some state run. No. Yeah, like Havana Phil has like he's he's got a bar, so and he's got a really good bourbon selection. He gets a lot of the quality bourbons which come into Greensboro because the ABC store puts that aside for him and other restaurants have really good bourbon selection rather than customers. Hmm. Yeah, I mean makes sense. Up, up here yeah. in Canada, um the reason our our, our yeah. liquor stores here in, in Alberta specifically are so uh Good. What the pricing is so fantastic is because we switched over from a um, from a government run system to privatized, and pretty much I think every other province in Canada is uh, government government distribution and government run. Um, so, Ontario oh, Ontario, definitely and is. I feel bad because you know I have friends in Ontario, and they're always like, "Hey, how much? How much is this bottle of scotch?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's like seventy five dollars. What is it there?" And they're like, "It's one hundred and thirty five dollars." And I'm like, "Oh." Sucks to be you, buddy, but, uh, you know. But in Florida, if there's something that's super, super limited, they can market oh, it up wow. to whatever they want. Yeah. They can, yeah, so if, if you're looking for anything that's super rare, super hard to find, and let's just say it costs, you know, it retails $100, it could be 500 on the shelf, no problem. You know, Jeez. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I have a buddy, Nick, uh, in, in Florida. I forget where in Florida he's at, but... He's saying he can't even find like plans for MSRP. Everywhere it's like hundred dollars for a bottle of yeah. plans, and people still buy it. They still buy it up down over there, and I'm like, that's ridiculous. hundred is cheaper plans wow. in Florida. That's the man. Yeah, I've seen it for three hundred. I buy it in duty free when I when I go down to Honduras or Nicaragua. <laughs> I buy it at duty free for sixty bucks <laughs> a liter. Yeah, I mean that's what you should be buying it for. You know, like I mean that yeah. that that's definitely I think it's, one of the upsides of having a privatized system here is that there's enough competition that if somebody took something even on the semi rare side and marked it up, they're not going to sell it because there's enough distribution here that somebody else has got it for sure. And unless you're doing, you know, like a lot of stores and a lot of uh, uh, shops, sh- cigar shops that have uh, uh, bars, they'll do an exclusive cask bottling for their store. Uh, people do that here, but again, I really don't find that they mark it up you know, exorbitantly. In fact, a lot of times you look at some of the store bottling stuff and for what it is and for what the money is, sometimes it's a better value than some of the distillery stuff for the price point. So. No. Well, definitely get a uh, store pick for a decent price, which is nice. Yeah. And usually it tastes better. I mean, I think there's an aspect right. of, you know, if, if the store owner is really into scotch, you know, the, presumably they tasted a bunch of stuff. If their palate can be trusted, well then, like for me with Kensington Wine Market, when Andrew gets a, a exclusive cask, it's just kind of an auto buy for me because I know he's got a really good palate. So it's like, well, I know you didn't bottle crap, so it's probably really good. The price is going to be absurdly good and it's cask strength. So it checks kind of all the boxes for me. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's you bring up a good point, John. Is you know if you're gonna buy store picks, you need to trust that store's ability to pick. So you shouldn't if just they, if they do if they do a lot of store picks, chances yeah. are they're pretty they're pretty good at it. Yeah, yeah. Because I know, for instance, like a shop local to me used to have incredible selections for whiskey, but they kind of turned to these guys where they mark up everything to secondary plus. And they still do these store picks, but they're not actually picking them. Um, and they're just getting, you know, sent whatever their the particular uh, distillery will pick for them. Um, and they, they become duds for the last, like, two, three that they've done. And I just stopped shopping there, right? So, like, there is stuff out there. Like, I was just talking to uh, – I, I didn't know this, by the way. I know we're, I'm going to talk bourbon, but, like, for Four Roses, for instance, um, I thought it used to be that for Four Roses for the barrel strength version – um, you have to uh, go to Four Roses uh, to pick barrel strength. But apparently, you don't need to do that anymore. Um, and uh, uh, Marvin at our, our fields, uh, Wine and Spirits, was telling me that now with most of these you know, brands out there and distilleries out there, like they'll just let you, they'll give you the option to be like, okay, we can pick some for you and just slap your uh, store name on there. Which kind of sucks because I'm like the whole point of like a store pick is hey, I'm you know uh, I believe in this product because I picked it, so that's kind of 
You know? The nice thing about my liquor store, my liquor store that I go to, is they will go and try other store store picks, and they will buy so much that, that they'll get it for a discount, and then just sell it for the normal MSRP anyways, mm. just to give their customers something different and cool to, to drink. Mm. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, instead of having to go to the store pick themselves. So I've gotten like bottles that were picked by Ritz Carlton or something like that, and <laughs> it's super interesting and super different, and it's it's Alec, have you had the opportunity yeah. to go over to Scotland and, and do like distillery stuff? I've been invited so many times, but the time that their weather is good enough for like us to go, whenever they invite us, it's uh-huh. like June, July, because yeah. the weather is great. And we have IPCPR, PCA every single year at that time, uh-huh. and it's just not the most opportune time to go. I was invited, I've been invited every year for the last five, six years. By Glen, oh, Glen Fiddick and Belvin need to go out well, there. Yeah. If the weather's not good, the whiskey still is good. So I'd I'd probably say it's probably worth going even if it's off season. I I want to go. Trust me. How often? How how much of an off season? How long is your off season? Because I hear it's mainly you know cold and wet there, right? I mean, it's always wet, right? It's always pretty much raining and yeah. a lot of a lot of a lot of the year. But I'm not I'm not sure exactly. Oh. They basically said, "Don't come November through February, for sure." Kind of a northern latitude mm-hmm. thing, yeah. It's like, uh, it's yeah. like Washington friends saying, "Don't come unless if it's like these like one and a half months out of the year. Don't bother, or else you get clinical depression." <laughs> My wife and I went. I think we went in September, and uh, yeah, I mean it was a little cool and 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 rainy, but like to be honest, I think it was warmer in Scotland at the time than it was at home here. Uh, and we did actually visit the Glenfiddich Distillery, which was a really great experience. I wish we had, if it, if it was up to me, we probably would have made the entire trip a distillery trip. But um, I might have been single by the end of that. Yeah, now you'd be divorced. The the funny thing yeah. is, she's she's really gotten into um, to whiskey uh, like really hardcore now, like to the point where she's polishing off bottles of Lagavulin. So. That I mean, that's a benefit because Dang. you know now I can propose that we go over to Scotland and do a distillery trip, and she I think she'd really enjoy that. We did, we did do a bunch of distilleries when we went to, ironically for her honeymoon, we went to Ireland, and I'd say like, forty percent of the time we were either in breweries or distilleries. So, pretty pretty great experience. That's cool. That's on the bucket list. Is uh, so, Scotland the- for me? The difference is you live in Canada. I live in Florida, so the weather is definitely going to be warmer in always. Florida than it is in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's always going to be the case, man. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like I obviously want to go back because you, you, like, so many people here go there all the time for for specifically Scotch things, and then you hear all these epic stories of tastings and you know these one off bottles that they got to taste that you'll never get to taste or they got a. They got the. Um, they got to uh, go through the cooperage and all these, you know, stuff that the normal person wouldn't get to experience. But because they went down with whoever, and obviously your 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 father and your company has uh, pretty good relationships with a number of distilleries, so that opens the door in a lot of ways to things that the average consumer is not going to be able to experience. Yeah, I think Kirsten was talking about um, warehouse, a experimental warehouse. Mm-hmm. And I don't think they let anyone in there, but the one thing I keep hearing is, if, if you come, we will let you in, <laughs> in warehouse eight. And I'm like, I, I, and they're like, you have to go to the back and try this one barrel. We like that, That's what I've been hearing for years, and trust me, I, I yeah. want to go. Yeah, I think there's probably something pretty special about uh, actually – you know, doing a tasting straight from the cask experience where they, they actually pop the stopper out and take a little, take a little, uh, I don't even know what the dipper's called, but they, you know, pull out a, pull out a dram and pour an absurd amount in your glass. I mean, that, that to me is kind of the, the penultimate experience. You got to say the right name. The bunghole. The bunghole. Okay. The (laughs) bunghole. Yeah. That's appropriately Scottish. It's such a great name. And, we'll, and yeah, you you uh, you get into the bunghole by using this thing that Big looks hammer? like a. It's a mallet. It's a rubber uh, mallet, isn't it? No, to to yeah. to, to, oh, the to little, actually get the whiskey. The probe, the little, yeah, yeah. 
You guys are such perverts. <laughs> Seth, did you ever grab your uh, your second whiskey of the night? Bun hole? I grab my bun hole all the time now, man. I haven't run in there yet. How's everyone's uh, third, third or I'm going to. I guess third whiskey for most people? How's that going? I just finished mine. It was great. I'm having a. Oh, go ahead, Alex. I was going to say I'm doing much lighter pour than you guys, though. That's why. Yeah, I'm I mean we're professionals. Don't tr- don't try this at home. Drink responsibly. Yada yada yada. <laughs> John's a pro. June's a pro. Aaron's Aaron's just Aaron, man. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Seth, you I know, would John, say you're a pro. I I'm I'm a pro, but not in like a pro sense. I'm like he's up Seth in that is, league, but not like in a pro. You know, it's he's Seth there. Is like, but like uh, it's a, you're, that's an you're old timer. Oh, he's an old timer. Dude, remember that Sazerac so, rye that we popped open fantastic. right at the house? Yeah. The bottle was half we actually, we 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 actually the house. did get the halfway through gone, the bottle man. in like 35 minutes, something like that. I was fucking, I was, was rocking and rolling. Good I was good to go. Oh, is that man, a Sazerac rye last year? Mm-hmm. Last year, dude. Uh, June, if you were there, the bottle would have been. Oh, 100%. Because John and I were tearing that thing up. <laughs> I looked around and I was anyone else drinking of this other than John and I? Nope. Good. <laughs> there's, a, there's a rule at Alec Bradley and it's don't try to keep up with the Glen Siddick and Bathor when it comes to drinking yeah. because they are uh, professional drinkers Seth I think you could keep up with them yeah I could no I can keep up with just about anyone I usually tell people don't even don't even try like I've gone to like uh, my wife works for British American Tobacco so I've gone to like the Reynolds Christmas parties and so forth mm-hmm. and Katie she's always like Y'all do not try and keep up with Seth. And I may kill myself, mm-hmm. but everyone else will be dead before I die. <laughs> so it's just Seth, you drink like all day, man. I see you like post, you know, you you have a rosé. Good, good at, for like, you, in Seth. Morning, don't don't be just... don't let him judge you. Don't let him no, judge you. Dude. Yeah. And I think I you basically it, pass out. Lunch. That's when you know you stop. You just like, judging. Like, dude, people people were shocked. I was start Easter, man. I was drinking champagne at eight. We didn't stop drinking. Lawn into the evening. Katie had to take a couple power morning. naps. Yeah. Oh, you got to start. Yeah, once you get going, it's like I'm like a diesel engine man. If you don't start in the morning, it's not. I mean, is, is there really exactly. any rules anymore with shelter and shelter in place? Really? I'm, no. Nope. No. No. I don't feel well, any shame. No. It, you know, as, I feel like as long as I'm having porridge for breakfast, then it's considered completely socially appropriate to be pouring a whiskey. If it's toast, maybe that'd be unacceptable. But as long as there's porridge there. You know, that's, that's fine. Scottish. I mean, listen, it's like, you know, rum, you know, if you're in the Caribbean, you know, or if you're in like Nicaragua, Honduras, having rum at, rum at breakfast, that's just, that's yeah, true. no kidding. Duh. hundred percent. Yeah. You got to put it. I mean, I've never had rum at, at <laughs> breakfast in Nicaragua or Honduras. I'm not going to yeah. lie. I, I think there's been times when Thank I've been in Nicaragua you. and I, I don't think there was really a a line between when we stopped drinking in the night and when we started drinking in the morning, I think we just kind of carried on through. So. Yeah. You just woke up and you were yeah. still going from the night four, right? I think, I think on St. Well, Patrick's day, like I woke up and before I had caught my coffee, I had some Jameson's. I was, I was just drinking some Jameson's <laughs> and watching the news. And my wife's like, that's good Irish coffee. I'm proud of you. I was like, yeah. thank you. Thanks for the support. <laughs> Right. Total total sidebar. I was actually reading because I was reading this um, <clears throat> history of Irish whiskey, and uh, the Irish coffee actually, believe it or not, brought Irish whiskey back from the brink of bankruptcy in Ireland. If you can imagine, yeah, and really? it started in um, it started in uh, San Francisco, of all places. I believe yeah. that. Really? Of course, I believe that. So Irish whiskey is not an Irish. Yeah, whiskey, well, right? Irish coffee is not not in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, yeah. No, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Irish coffee, not Irish. Whiskey. I mean, how many of these, like, how many of these, like, industries, whether it's Irish whiskey or like Scotch, have been revised by something? You know what I mean? I mean, wine. I think it's just one of these things that's been classic, but I think. You know, th- there's been low points, but then, then all these items, even cigars. You mean prohibition? <laughs> not even, yeah, yeah, not even prohibition. But I think it's just consumers go through, you know, go through like waves. So it's like rosé is kind of back. Rosé's, I, I would say rosé's kind of been back for like 
two or three years. Thumbs down. But listen, we had a friend. He actually kind of actually he died like two nights ago um, from cancer. But oh, he was he was talking about Rose is going to make a comeback. And we're like, shut the hell up, Robert. You you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And then Rose makes a comeback, and we're like, holy crap! How the hell did he pick that one up? And it, I mean, Rose is kind of still around right now. Rose is kind of in right now. Yeah, it's in. Well, remember like eight eight years ago when Baca made that giant push with all their flavored mm-hmm. Baca? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I thought they were crazy. Oh, yeah. Actually, we just said about Kool Aid, man. That was it about was... eight eight nine years ago. One of the things I wanted to talk to George about that. I find amazing in the whiskey industry is that, I mean, first of all, starting a new distillery is insanity because you, you know, like you're borrowing money from the bank. You're not really going to produce anything tangibly for three years. And then the idea that you have to kind of forecast your market like 10 or 15 years out, pretty much like oil and gas is to me insanity. And, you know, they really have to ride those, those crests and peaks of the industry going up and down a little bit like tobacco actually. Well, they're Not making really. hand sanitizer right now. I don't think that's true because if you look at most of these new distilleries, they're buying things from Heaven Hill or MGP for the yeah, first sourcing you know, three, yeah, three yeah. years at least. Yeah, so, I mean, even though you're not going to see your own product for at least three years, potentially, at least you can yeah. source from other people. Yeah. That's also kind of interesting because it's like, you know, you have guys that, while they wait for their own distillate to mature to the point where they want to be proud to bottle and sell it, like let's say, you know, like most of them, of course, will source American whiskey and bourbon out of MGP. But like I've I've had uh, some like American whiskey, American bourbon brands in which I loved their ability to pick good MGP barrels. But once they came out with their own distillate, I was like, oh, fuck this, <laughs> this is terrible. I, I like I'm done. Same, I had that same thing. I feel bad naming who it is, so I won't. Yeah, that's. I was gonna name an example, but I was like, no, that's pretty. Let's not do that. <laughs> John, don't you think that some of like, let's say you're gonna open a distillery in in Scotland, and I don't know if people have done this. You you may know there's, this there's more a, than I do, and you may just think that this is complete blasphemy. Dude, I'll just let you know. There's a couple that run the uh, Scotch Malt Society here in Calgary, in Canada. They opened a distillery in Edinburgh. Uh, I think it's about two years old now, year and a half old. Okay, couldn't they hypothetically, while at the same time, I imagine, let's say you're making scotch to put aside so that it's aging right now. So it's in the barrel and it's just chilling. It's waiting its years until you can categorize it as scotch. I'm, I'm correct, yep. correct? Yes. Three years, baby. Three years right, in so a day, me- actually. In the meantime, three years in a day. So in the meantime, they can be making gin. Which is what they and do. And they could also yep. be making. Yep. Absolutely. And they, could, and they could also, and I don't know if anyone's done this. And you may make fun make fun of this, but I I, I bet it would work over there because Europeans are, are I can just sense this. What if they just said you know American bourbon whiskey made in Scotland? The, I mean, I don't, I don't think, think you can do that. that. I don't think I don't think there's an intermediate step that you can bottle anything and call it anything other than vodka. But it but it needs le- I mean, if you made like a an American like a bourbon. You look at the legal requirements yep. for bourbon in the United States, and, and it's still going to take some time before you can release it. But I think it would almost be like you can get gin out there pretty quick. You can get your hand sanitizer out there. Then you could get your bourbon, and then you could well, eventually also, get your scotch. They like, also do new yeah. make, which is just a clear distillate that comes. Yeah, like from, mash. You know, with, a little, yeah, white, a little going, white lightning. Going into, yeah, exactly, white lightning. So they Oof. saw that as well. While they're waiting, yeah, everybody loves moonshine, man. But I, but I have to wonder, like, how much? Oh, dude, good moonshine, June. Have you ever had really good moonshine? There is That's no not true. Thing. Blasphemy. That's not Blasphemy. true. There's actually true. some. There's actually some really good down. moonshine you out there. Get your ass down to South. I'm gonna take you. To, I'm gonna take you to my guy in Franklin County, Virginia. You're gonna have moonshine <laughs> that is just gonna rock your world, man. As long as he's not racist. The only thing I don't well, like about moonshine. <laughs> The only thing that I don't like about moonshine is when they add right. all the sugar to it. It's just yeah. it's too much for me. Have you ever had apple pie moonshine? Of course I have. Dude, I have a. I don't, I don't have any of that at home. You know what I did with it? I drain poured oh. it and I'm using it as a cup to drink water out Dude, of it. There's, there's nothing like 
wandering off into the woods while fly fishing <laughs> after having too much apple pot moonshine. That's the part of the experience, man. That's, That's part of fly California fishing. Life, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Have you guys ever discussed why why making whiskey in the United States is illegal, but every other alcohol to make at home is perfectly legal? No, we have not. Oh, it's hmm. probably well. It's because the industry has protected itself with the government. That's why it's like you can't grow peanut. You can't do peanuts as well, man. Taxes and tariffs. That's why. Yeah, Monday is so big in importing Scotch and Irish whiskey that they it's illegal to make whiskey at home. Versus you can make beer, you can make wine, you can make whatever you want at home except for whiskey. Hmm. Yeah, I mean it was, and that dates back to you know, the colony period. I mean, the, the idea of, you know, making that Kentucky whiskey in, in the colonies, the crown didn't want anything to do with that. That's money they're losing. Well, and I mean, tying it back to the scotch industry and George, both George and Kirsten kind of talked about it. Of course, the, you know, the Scots don't like to pay taxes. I mean, you know, known as my, my people are known as a very uh, thrifty, thrifty people. And uh, so they say the distilleries, that they knew of before the 1800s, before the official tax periods came in, could have been in the in the many many hundreds, but you'll never know because they had no interest whatsoever in paying the tax man his due, and it really wasn't until the Brits realized that, okay, you know, they'll pay a certain amount of tax that they deem that's reasonable, so we'll we'll pull that back, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, 175 distilleries appear out of nowhere, and it's like, oh yeah. No, we've got a distillery. Uh, we're we're ready to pay taxes, and it's like, yeah, well, that's that's what it ends up being about is uh, paying the tax man his due, and whether you want to do that or not. Well, it's because listen, man, no no royal tax collector, no you know British soldier who's stationed up in Scotland is going to want to go into a valley to try and collect money from these. I think that's known man. as what's what's I mean, known I as a, do called it. a bad move. It's a, yeah. yeah, it's like the tax collector is like, I ain't going down that road. I don't blame him on that. It's like, who's, who's he harming? Plus, what did, no what did George say? It would have taken the guy like, uh, like 20 days by horse to get into the highlands to, to find some of these places? Yeah, the whiskey's the only thing keeping the Scots from going full berserk, man. This was told to me by, by a Scotsman, actually. So uh, I'm just going to repeat what he said. You know the difference between a coconut and a Scotsman? Uh oh. Have no, I haven't heard this one? this one. No, I have not. This is classic, though. I'm harder, like, I know. Harder, to, yeah, harder to get a drink out of a coconut <laughs> than a coconut. <laughs> I take offense at that, sir. But then, you know, I'm Canadian, not really Scott, so. <laughs> I'm just, I'm no, just repeating good. what he said. You know, you know what That's was really interesting for me when I was over in Scotland? Um, when I was in Edinburgh, I went down the uh, the Whiskey Mile and uh, stopped in at a few places as one does. And it was funny, uh, and I think Kirsten kind of talked about this, that the scotch really isn't being drank by young people in Scotland. And so I ordered a dram, and I don't even remember now what I ordered, um, but I remember it being like, I think it was 40 or 43% ABV. And the guy was like, uh, you know, do you want a do thing of water with that? And I'm like... No, it's only, it's only 43%. I don't, I don't need any water. And he's like, oh, you're a tough guy, huh? And I'm like, no, it's, it's just, it's pretty approachable ABV and I don't put water in my whiskey. It's nothing to do with toughness. I just, you know, but, but that's like, that's how whiskey is consumed is, um, if you're to consume whiskey there, you're going to do it in a mixed drink or, you know, not, not as a, as a neat beverage. Yeah. It's insane. What is the uh, most prized bottle that oh. you guys have? Probably not so much for Aaron and Seth, but I'm curious as to what. What the hell that's <laughs> supposed to mean? Well, Seth, you treat fucking moonshine, wow. okay? So. Whoa. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love moonshine. God bless America. Anyways, uh, what is the most prized possession of a bottle that you guys own? Um, well, Alec, yeah, Alec. why don't you go first? Oh. You want me to go first on that one? Yeah. So my most prized possession in terms of bottles has to be a Glenfiddich mm. Malt Master because they haven't made it in years. It's impossible to find. It's one of my 
favorite bottles of Glen Fiddick, and I wish they would reproduce it. And I basically beg them every time I talk to them. It is just the most approachable, drinkable whiskey I've ever had. And the fact that they make it just, or that they made it, just makes it that much better because of our relationship. Mm-hmm. Have you guys no. ever had that, the Malt Master? No, I'm not. We'll okay, have it the so next I time we're one down bottle. There, yeah. yeah, I have one bottle of, or one bottle. Of <laughs> oh, yeah. Before, See, that's but yeah. I would be that's we'll finish, that's, we'll that's, that's, off that's tough to open minutes. those bottles. They're, just invite well, it over no, to your house. Condition. I'll bring some flowers if, and pie, and then we'll open it up. If you open, so here's up. the problem. I know a store down here that has three bottles of them of that of that specific uh, whiskey. But when it came out, it was like seventy five, eight dollars a bottle, and they're asking yeah. over three hundred for it. So it's just really hard for me to justify. Yeah buying a bottle that I know cost like 75 to 80 when it came out yeah. for 300 Well, listen, there's five of us, 60 a person. We'll each get a little tickle. It'll be worth so it. So if I open that bottle, my father will like <laughs> sense it somehow that he loves that bottle as well. <laughs> it sounds like we've got the making of a party here. Pay a share. Yeah, and he will. He will. Uh, he would be pissed if I did not invite him. To See now, the the, the trick there is you got to tell him to bring the old the uh, mm-hmm. the old good fine and rares, right? You open the whiskey, but only if he brings the fine and oh, rares. Yeah. He has he has the malt master. He just he just the, yeah. He just want to open it. Yeah. <laughs> no, he drinks it. He drinks Uh-oh. it regularly. He Uh-oh. loves that bottle. He, he has plenty. I have one. That's the problem. Yeah. So man's man right there. Tell him to bring yeah. coils, man. I don't need the fine rare. Just yeah, bring the coils. Oh, I got one right here. Well, that's not going to oh. do me. Seth right loves now, the great right? Dude, it's a great. I, yeah, have you smoked it, June? Um, yeah, I smoked it at Alec Bradley, <laughs> actually. Dude, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's balanced, man. Where, where did, did you, you smoke that, June? That earlier. I like that. You like that. I snuck it in there at Alec Bradley headquarters, Seth. Headquarters. <laughs> right there. That's right. Yeah. You want a medal, June? You want a medal? June, June barely <laughs> remembers it, though. Yeah. yeah. It is, <laughs> we have a decent amount of Good for you. That day, so. Yeah. Dude, those donuts, by the way, I loved those donuts we had. June, I could have put <laughs> capers in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, seriously, those donuts are fucking amazing. We had at your Next time you're down, I'll grab them. Not a problem. Oh, oh man. Strong <laughs> either. Mm. <laughs> Hmm? is good too. Mm-hmm. So to answer your original question, Jim, uh, I have a oh. bottle. Oh. I, have a, I have a bottle of uh, Malt Society Kurosawa, um, which I think is I think has been closed since like the early 1990s. So Japanese whiskey, it's cask strength. Um, that's kind of my unicorn bottle, um, and then my other unicorn bottle will probably be a uh, Little Mill. Uh, Little Mill 21, and I've got the 22, and they're both same thing. It's closed distillery where somebody owns the uh, casks, so they they keep doing these bottlings every couple of years, and the I mean the bottles go for seemingly at the time the bottles go for an absurd amount, and then you open it and you're like, oh, I'm so glad I bought this, and then a year later you find out that the price went up by three times, and you're like, oh, I'm so glad I opened that bottle. So, are you talking about yeah, the yeah. Scotch Small Whiskey Society? Oh, little, little fun fact. My, um, I don't know if he was like the original owner, one of the original owners, but my neighbor was one of the original, like growing up was one of the original owners. No kidding. That's called Malt Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Yeah. Oh. And then they sold it, but. They, I mean, they have that. The problem with societies like that, like all whiskey acquisitions is that the wonderful thing is they have these unique one-off bottlings from, and you can get a, a bottling from a distillery that you love, and it's got the characteristics of that distillery, but like nothing you've ever tasted. So you're like, oh, that's fantastic. I must own that. And they're like, great. And then next month, they also have another bottling from that distillery that is unique and doesn't taste. And you're like, okay, I guess I must own that. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have 65 bottles from the Malt Society, and, and your wife is saying, why is our living room a Scotch storage facility? And that's just how it goes. That's, That's right. your most prized bottle. That's cool. What's That's it cool. say? Wait, Kurosawa is then the director. Yeah. Akira Kurosawa. Kurosawa was the, um, was the Japanese and... distillery, and um, 
Yeah, it was. It, oh, okay. I, I don't know. It was a weird time because Japan wasn't doing particularly well uh, internationally for whiskey sales. Um, so they closed it and like so many things like you hear, um, uh, like Port Ellen, um, is a good example where, uh, people didn't really get crazy about the whiskey until the distillery had been closed for like eight or 10 years. And then all of a sudden people couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. Could FOMO people. Yeah. It's the demand. See, that's what I was talking about, June, the waves. Yeah. I can't wait till the moonshine <laughs> demand really goes up. <laughs> You know what, June? <laughs> Don't hate it. Listen, you grew up in Missouri, and now you're just shitting on real American people, man. It's Dude, just... I grew up in Missouri, man. You... That's real America right I... there. That's, that's America. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Bro. What do you say? I mean, listen, I'm in North Kakalaki, man. This is real American people down here. Guys, I'll be back in just one second. Sorry. All right. Yeah, the... um. John, my most prized possession is the bottle. Dude, that that's... I tell you what, when you... When you picked up that bottle, I was like, that was a great acquisition because like it's, it's reasonably priced. I think it, it's, great it's a great, there's, I find there's certain bottles from a distillery where like, and it could be the 12 year, it could be the 14 year, it could be the 15 year, it could be the 18 year. And I, f- I find like there's, there's one particular bottle and you're like, that bottle represents sort of the best character of that distillery. And for me, that 14 has probably got to be it. It's nice. And, you know, I like a good value. You know, I'll wait, I'll wait till Alec gets back and I'll make fun of him for this. But, June, you can make fun of me. But looks like he's sitting in his house and he has a lawn chair in his house. I think he's in his garage. Actually. I mean, yeah. I hope so. Because if that's his living well, room, people, we have some serious so, problems that we need think, to talk about. You know what he needs? He needs some Eiffel Tower paintings like that. <laughs> he needs some <laughs> <laughs> some french providential uh you know we should we should have told him that well sure i guess some not... of the other guys are watching this are like alec man they're bashing you yeah, but i'll bash him when he gets back to see man. you know the great thing is he's got a perfect white background he could have done a, a virtual background of uh like a tobacco field yeah, in honduras it little it looks like his like the, his walls all messed up but hopefully it's a garage it's a garage it's, it's yeah. gotta be a garage yeah i mean that's like he was playing little like floor hockey or some ping pong balls or something. Is there a lot of floor hockey in Florida? I feel like there's not a floor hockey in Florida. Probably not. Floor hockey is pretty is. damn. You don't know what floor hockey is? You never play floor hockey? Is that like roller skates and hockey? Yeah. Like no, Mighty Ducks hockey. when they uh, oh when they God. practice in Mighty Ducks three. Mighty Ducks three <laughs> is fantastic. It the is Mighty Ducks movies are fantastic. Yeah. This is John. Man, this is. I don't think I would have bought this for that show this is this glymphatic is just beautiful it, it, man i'm telling you man like you know like that's why people get so hung up on age statements and i'm like I, I mean i get hung up on age statements too but that's a perfect example of where like you don't have to get crazy to get a bottle that like is really really good and to be frank and hopefully kirsten's not tuning in but it probably should be selling for more than it is in the market yeah it, it, you could sell for more, and I'd buy it for more. Yeah. Alec, are you in your garage? That? Alec, are you in your garage or in your house? In my garage, why? Okay, well, I was just worried because <laughs> you had like that lawn chair. I was like, man, I hope he's not in his house, man. I hope he actually has furniture and so forth. Well, I just I moved the week that this whole quarantine oh. started. Oh. So, yeah, so it has not been the easiest of moves. Um, but yeah. Uh, I'm in my garage right now. I figured it'd be easier than sitting in the backyard. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so do you get? So you have a house? Did you get a house, or do you have like a townhome? Or yeah, yeah, just moved into a house. I was in an apartment before. Nice. And is your is your brother? What's he living? Apartment. He lives in an apartment in downtown yeah, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Oh yeah, he does. See, that's yeah. that's that's where we're gonna go crash. We're not gonna mess up your house, but I'm gonna mess up your brother's house. <laughs> oh, for sure. No. Problem. Oh, sweet. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, here's my fourth bottle. This is a, uh, I think it's a duty free exclusive. It just says Glenfiddich Reserve Cask. And I haven't had this in a while. So, nice. you know, give us a try. Cask. What, uh, what, what, yeah, t- tell us more about that. What, well, it's the cask that was left in reserve. Jim. Duh. <laughs> Fucking A, Sad. You truly tricky motherfucker, man. <laughs> All it says is a rich single malt matured in, let's see, in 
<laughs> Specially reserved sherry cask and married in our unique Valera vat to create the exceptional deep and mellow whiskey. Hmm. Oh, yeah, they were talking 40, about this. Forty percent. They were talking about that Solera. John, break that down for me, man. The <sighs> Solera vat. Oh, they, they use that for the 15. Oh, gosh. Um, awesome. So, I mean, I don't even know. I, I don't know if I'm sober enough to talk about Solera. Um, be, no, no, it's I'm all sorry, good. I, I just, you spot. know, I wasn't prepared. I, I had no idea what the heck it was. I, I think was you should know. I was thinking, son. I mean, uh, John. I should, you and, like you know, this. if if well, I had done my show prep, I would have been ready for the Solera <laughs> question. And I don't, I don't know that I can adequately talk about it, actually. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I'll, I'll go into that. Um, I could be completely wrong here. I've had a decent amount to drink, but I believe the Solera vat is this giant vat that they have, and it has multiple layers. And from the day that it's filled to, to the day, like, till today, what they do is it has multiple stages, and they're able to open each stage and pour uh, whiskey into the next level. So let's say that originally the Glenfiddich 15, which I believe is in the Solera cask, is at, is at the bottom, then they filled up the second, third, fourth, and fifth layer. They're able to open each one and add whiskey to the next layer down as they're pulling from the, um, from, as they're pulling from the vat. And what that is supposed to do is add a level of consistency because the thought process is there's still some liquid in there from the original right. vat that they started yeah so, so that's i believe that is the i could be completely wrong I, I, wicked, something else completely, I, but that's, I believe what it is and what'd yeah, you get i think basically what you said in the solera process the succession of containers are filled with a product over a series of equal aging intervals usually a year a group of one or more containers called scales or nurseries <laughs> or places are f Classes are filled for each interval. At the end of the interval, after the last scale is filled, the oldest scale in the Solera is tapped for part of its content, which is bottled. Huh. I st I'm still fucking lost. So we're going to have to talk to someone else about this, too. <laughs> so let's say they empty half of it, half of the, of, the, of the bottom part of it. Then they open up the next layer, and half of that pours into it. And then they close it, open up the next layer, the other half pours into that, and it's supposed to create this level of consistency. And the thought process, like I said, is that some of the original liquid is still on that bottom vat, and it should create this complete yeah, level Yeah, it's the idea that you can have really, really John, old whiskey, you know, whiskey yeah. right married with really, really young whiskey, married with you know really, really middle-aged whiskey to kind of continue this. Yeah, it's, I mean... Balance it out, or... I mean, it, it all comes out of the barrel at 15 right. years, at years of oh, age, okay, and then okay. it goes into the style, right. I believe, yeah. Was it, I mean, yeah. so bit, is it, it, am I wrong in saying that it's like to the continue, or to have continuity throughout vintages, 100%. I guess? Is it's that like balsamic vinegar, where you have to have like a source. Yeah. You have to have like a, like a continuous source yeah. for yes, your entire like generation that. of families. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's... You hear that, Jude? Mm -hmm. You hear that? You good? Yeah. He's got a Solera in his garage. <laughs> no, I think that's an infinity <laughs> bottle. That's not really the same thing. <laughs> do, you, do you do an infinity bottle at all, Alec? Baby bottle. I have, and it's horrible. So I actually have a... Um, that's what I'm saying. Answer. Why do, why do people and... do that? I don't understand. Just drink the last of the whiskey and enjoy it. Why mix it? You know what I mean? So, I decided recently that instead of just pouring every whiskey into my decanter that I finish, I'm going to choose a handful of uh, companies that I'm going to be willing to only pour their whiskey into that to keep there a level of consistency. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to do one. I'm going to do one for scotch and one for nice. bourbon. Mm. That makes more sense. Yeah. That works. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Why would instead you? Yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mix a lot of stuff. Is that what people are oh, doing? Oh, yeah, is that yeah. what you did? The bottle is like the fin the, the last the heels. last dram of a bunch of yeah. bottles all into one. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but I didn't think you'd be like putting anything in and everything in there. Yeah. You know what I mean? I yeah, thought it was basically. yeah, that's crazy, dude. It's the all yeah. sorts jug. Well, I was put, stupid. put a little that's seasoning enough. in there, Sorry, man. Sink. Put some bay leaves, put some cumin. Yeah. <laughs> 
adding bourbon and peat oh, scotch into yeah, the same no. uh, infinity bottle was so. So, so I ended up doing <laughs> um, a peated and unpeated Oof. infinity bottle, just straight scotch, and. Even within that, uh, like I wish my unpeated bottle I had separated between bourbon casks and not and non bourbon casks because same thing like it, it I, I yeah. can drink it and it's not terrible but it's also not good which is kind of defeating the purpose of having an infinity bottle I think it's kind of like when you see the kids go to the soda fountain and they get every single one of the sodas in their cups yeah. swamp water yeah. swamp yeah. swamp water is that what they call it down south yeah swamp man. Water? That's what we call it uh, up that's north. That's what we called it. I always encourage kids to do it just so they can get jacked up to fuck up their parents' day for the rest of their life. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's uh, coming coming to a close here for this uh, poor and tell. We're just about at the uh, just about at the two hour mark. And you lost, yeah, light, lost light. So I don't know. How... Yeah. Would you lose power already in California? You guys are gonna uh... have zombies soon. <laughs> See us Southerners, we're not used to power. We got our power cut off at a certain time, you, anyways. Yeah. So, you you can see we, way we up here north. Anything. Um, we've still got light, and I'll still have light for another hour. So, yeah. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. We get. Oh yeah. Uh, Wait, what time is it? Nine o'clock. Oh shit! It's eleven o'clock. I'm man. with you. I'm with you, Sam. It's pitch black out here. Yeah, it's dark. Oh, that's oh, that's a trip. Oh. <laughs> Wait till it's summer. June, the, oh, June, oh yeah, dude. Like it's, in the summertime, I can do a show. Up, I can do a no, show no, till like eleven thirty at night, and it, it'll look like daylight. Maybe I forgot. I forgot what it felt like. Apparently, I forgot what it felt like. June, wait till you figure out what time it is in Australia. You'll totally take that, one, man. <laughs> Did didgeridoo <laughs> o'clock? <laughs> Alec, uh, I want to thank you very much for being on the show oh, okay, and uh, talking whiskey awful. and with us because uh, that was a lot of fun. We'll have to have you on again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Anytime, guys. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, we'll do a we'll do a Absolutely. bourbon session this next, next time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I got too many bottles for that. So Sweet. yeah, <laughs> That's fantastic. It'll be great. I'll like fifteen bottles out here. Thanks to all our audience who yeah. tuned in for this episode, live episode of Pour and Tell. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, I don't think we've announced it yet, and. Uh, Stay tuned for the announcement. Probably, I'm thinking next week we've got uh, June. I think spilled the beans early on in the show, but uh, we've got an interesting show coming up on May the 11th, um, which you'll definitely want to tune in for. Um, and uh, I think we're going to do another one of these after the show, little uh, peated session to tease it because yeah, we'll yep. tease. I know Aaron will be down for that. Um, so tip a glass, and we'll see you yep. in a couple weeks. See you guys.